All right. Wonderful. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Susan. I am the Director of International Programs at Engineering World Health. Um, I am here to share a little bit about our Summer Institute program today and give you some background on our organization, what we do, and hopefully um, get you convinced to get involved with our programs. So to begin, I'm going to provide just an overview of Engineering World Health um, and how we were founded, how we have grown over the years, and what we do today. Um, so EWH was founded in 2001 with the goal of engaging university students and young professionals, I will add, to help improve healthcare delivery of clinics and hospitals in low-resource countries. Um, so that was our initial, our initial goal, our initial mission. And we have 20 years later expanded to a variety of different engineering education initiatives that you can see on our nice wheel to the right. Um, we offer uh, engineering education initiatives such as our, our biomedical, biomedical instrumentation kits. We have a university chapters program. Um, and then we also offer virtual exchanges um, as well. So today we are going to be focusing on our summer institutes, which is kind of the core of engineering world health. Um, it's why we were founded back in 2001 and what we are going to be focusing on today. So why do we offer the institutes? Um, this is a topic that you definitely will learn a lot more about and delve into more deeply on the program in your training month. Um, but I, of course, wanted to give you a little bit of context and background about why we offer these programs um, and why we think they're important and really want to get a lot of students engaged. Um, so many hospitals around the world rely on donated medical equipment to treat patients. Um, however, a lot of this potentially life-saving equipment arrives unusable. So a lot of times, it perhaps seems like it is a good idea and it's a well-intentioned donation, but there are a lot of factors that are um, that are in play that perhaps are not so obvious or that perhaps might not come to mind immediately. Um, a lot of donations arrive unusable for a lot of different reasons. Um, perhaps the, the energy source is not compatible in the hospital with that piece of equipment or the country where it comes from. Um, there are a lot of outdoor areas in the hospitals that EWH works in, so perhaps it's not designed to weather the environments. Perhaps there is no no user manual, or if there is one, it's in the wrong language. Um, there's no helpline that technicians can call um, if equipment is not working. So oftentimes these donations just end up sitting in, um, in what we call at EWH equipment graveyards. Um, so we have a couple of photos over there to the right that actually were taken on our institute programs. So you can see the, um, the amount of equipment that is donated and is just sitting in hospitals um, out of use which of course we want to resolve. Um, so then on top of that, um, even the equipment that does arrive usable to these hospitals, it falls out of service a lot more quickly than equipment um, in the United States, for example, might. Um, and again, this is just for some, some of those similar reasons that there is fewer, um, fewer trained staff perhaps in that area, um, lack of spare parts or no access to spare parts, um, or again, just no ability to, um, to, to figure out how to fix this equipment um, as we might um, here in the US and be able to kind of call that helpline number. So um, as you can imagine, this issue has a lot of effects on healthcare delivery. Um, so patients must wait or travel long distances for a critical treatment if the equipment that is not needed is not in use. At times, procedures cannot be performed safely or at all. Um, hospital efficiency is diminished and capacity is strained overall of what the hospital can do. And then, of course, hospital revenue is affected, which kind of creates a cycle that exacerbates the problem because if the hospital is not receiving that income that they might otherwise for having performed this procedure, then they have even less resources and the problem um, remains and fewer resources to, to fix the equipment that they do have. So what can you do to help solve this problem? Um, EWH Summer Institutes provide intensive training to university students and young professionals in STEM fields, and then place them in hospitals in low resource areas of Central America, Southeast Asia, and East and West Africa to serve as volunteer biomedical equipment technicians. Um, so that is the, the basis of our program. They're nine week programs. Um, and I am going to get in to um, a little bit of our offerings that we have this upcoming year. Um, we have some stats down here that since 2004, we've been running the institutes with over 1300 volunteers, 14,000 repairs and an estimated value of over $30 million in repairs. 
All right, so our 2024 Summer Institutes, our applications just opened October 1st, so you are right on time to get your application in. We are going to Guatemala and Uganda next summer. Um, both programs are nine weeks long and are on these same dates. Um, I love this photo right here. That was from our program last summer, and it was on our first group hospital visit day. So that was during training month and the first time that everyone got to go receive um, or got to go visit a hospital after like a couple of days of training. So really get in there and get their first day of field work experience. Um, I think I took this photo actually. <laughs> so I like that one. All right. Okay, so program outlined. As I mentioned, these are nine week programs uh, divided into kind of a four week component of training and then a five week component of um, the volunteer placement. So month one is going to be your language and technical training. And then month two is going to be your volunteer placement where you'll actually put those skills to work in a real life hospital setting. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail um, about what each month entails. The technical and language training month. So when you first arrive, um, you are going to study the operation, function, and design of common medical and lab equipment. And you are going to really learn how to make these repairs when resources are limited. That's really the whole idea behind engineering world health is how to get creative and work under the circumstances that our partner hospitals actually face. Um, so it's certainly going to be different than perhaps um, a, a class, an instrumentation class that you've taken at, at your university, because you'll be kind of on the ground in these, um, in these new environments where we don't have all of the resources at our disposal, um, as you might otherwise, or perhaps you might at your university. So we have a lab component, a lecture component, um, and then also language lessons, because we are very focused as well on um, on being immersed in the in the cultural and the local community um, as visitors. So in Guatemala, our students study Spanish. And then in Uganda, our students study Luganda, which is a local indigenous language there. Um, in addition, as I mentioned that that group photo on the last slide, um, you'll also have the opportunity to have a couple of field work days incorporated into your training month. So the whole cohort will go to a hospital um, as a group to really get some hands on practice as you're still getting into training. Um, your instructor and your TAs will go as well. Um, so that is always, um, always helpful for our students to kind of have that group experience prior to being assigned to their hospital. And then in addition, you will have the opportunity to go on a cultural excursion. So that's sometimes a day trip, sometimes a weekend trip, um, but that is not engineering related at all. It is just for fun um, because we definitely want students to have the opportunity to explore their, um, their country and, and culture. All right, month two, um, volunteer placement. So when you really get to put your knowledge to use. Um, so instead of living as a group, as we do during the first month of the program, we'll divide students up into groups of two to four total, and you'll be assigned to a different hospital around the country, and you will go to work there every day. Um, you'll repair medical equipment, you'll conduct preventive maintenance, perhaps you'll develop user guides or translate equipment manuals if that's something that you're interested in or if that's something that the hospital needs. You also will be able to complete a secondary project. What that is, is a project that is in addition to your, your repairs and your maintenance and the things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We encourage students to interview hospital staff and kind of as you develop these relationships, with the, the staff at your, um, at your hospital and your technicians, you'll be able to identify um, another need that the hospital might, um, might face and develop a project that addresses that need. So as I said, this doesn't have to be technical. Um, some students like it to be, um, and they have done that in the past, like when one student group created a call system from some patient beds to a nurse's desk, which was in the more technical realm of things. Other students have made um, blankets, um, for, for nurseries, for babies, or have painted a mural in the children's department of the hospital. So really lots of different things. Um, this is something, again, is really up to the, the combination of the student group and the hospital staff. Um, and you can develop your own secondary project, which is just another way for us to, us to help out while we're there. Um, and then kind of on, on another side of things, just living in a different community for a month, this is a really great cultural exchange opportunity. Um, you definitely are going to be living and working in situations that you very likely would not have on a typical tourist trip. So our programs are very unique in that respect. Um, and then you'll gain a lot of confidence as an international citizen. And I, I really like this one because I'm not an engineer myself, um, but I think that it is so important and valuable for students to have that experience of just being in a 
totally new place where you're entirely out of your comfort zone and you're just learning a new way of life. Um, so I really like that our programs are an opportunity for that. All right, a couple more details about our 2024 offerings. Um, as I said, we are going to Guatemala and Uganda. Program dates are the same. The training location. So for that first month, everyone's going to be together and everyone is going to be in, in one location for your first four weeks of training. In Guatemala, that is Shela, which is the second largest city in Guatemala. It's about four hours away from Guatemala City. And then in Uganda, that is in Kampala, and that is the capital of Uganda. Um, so, so rather close to the airport that you'll be flying into, which is nice and convenient. Um, as far as language taught, we already touched on that. Um, in Guatemala, of course, is Spanish. And then in Uganda, the language is Luganda. Um, in Guatemala, I will add language lessons are a lot bigger of a component um, in that program than in the Uganda program, because the hospitals that we work in in Guatemala, there is almost no English spoken at all. Um, so it's not a requirement that students have any sort of language skills prior to joining the program. Although if you do choose to go on the Guatemala program, it of course is, it's helpful for you to, to have a bit of Spanish background um, going into it. But like I said, certainly not a requirement. Um, we do have students that come in every year with, with zero, starting from zero Spanish knowledge. So we have Spanish lessons on that program um, in the morning and then our technical training is in the afternoon. And then in Uganda, um, we have Luganda lessons, I believe it's just once a week or so. So um, it's not quite as much just because it's not quite so necessary since English is one of the official languages in Uganda as well. Um, and then as far as partner goes, partners go, we also work with partners, local partners in each of our two program countries. And that's really key for engineering world health as well, um, is being able to partner with an organization that has a permanent presence in that country um, and is really, really familiar and is able to make really good connections with hospitals um, and, and support us in that way. So in Guatemala, one of our partners is Do Guatemala. Um, they are a tourism agency, a volunteer agency based in Shela. And then Universidad del Valle in Guatemala City is our other partner. They are a university in Guatemala City, and we actually um, enroll their students in our program as well. Um, so same goes for Uganda. Our partner there is Makerere University. Um, they are our home base. So we'll have class on campus at Makerere University during training month. And then we enroll with their students in the program as well. Um, so that is um, a really exciting part of the programs, I think, and a really cool component of cultural exchange that, um, that is unique to engineering world health. Um, so alongside working with students from around the world who are traveling to Uganda and Guatemala, you'll be able to work with students who are from those two countries too and learn about kind of their curriculum that they have learned and of course um, experience their culture from their perspective, which is exciting. Um, I also will add here this, we have a frequently asked questions page on our website. I won't click on this link right now, but I really, really do encourage everyone to check that out. Um, it's a really great resource for learning more about what life is like on our institutes because they are unique programs. Um, and so I think that that is a very helpful resource as well. All right, so the fun stuff, tuition. Um, so tuition for each of the nine week programs is $8,500. However, if you submit your application by October 31st, so just about two weeks, um, you automatically are going to get a discount of $1,000. So it's automatically going to drop to $7,500. On top of that, we do have a significant financial aid um, scholarship available. Um, so in 2023, 98% of participants received financial aid and the average award was $2,000. Um, so I really, really do want to emphasize that, that although the, the ticket price is $8,500, we are very, very eager to work with students in order to get that tuition number down. So we have lots of options. We really do have financial aid that is widely available. It's not a situation where one in every 10 students gets it. If you apply, we will be able to provide you with at least a percentage of your request. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that students know that and know that we are really, really eager to, to work with you um, so that we can meet a tuition number that works. Um, low interest loans are also available for up to $2,500. So that is another excellent um, option as well. Um, and then a final reminder that our priority deadline is December 1st. We'll get to that slide a little bit later on for application deadlines, but um, always good to get your application in early. 
um, especially when it comes to um, to your financial aid award and just getting that all squared away as soon as possible. And then a couple of just bullet points that I'll mention under this photo right here. Um, you're going to receive a complete tuition breakdown in your welcome packet upon acceptance. That's very important to us too, that you know exactly where your money is going, um, that it is being well spent and wisely spent on your program. And then I also would like to encourage everyone to read the appendices and the program terms and conditions. So this is in your application packet that you will download right before you apply. Um, and that's just really great information um, to let you know what is included in tuition, what's not included, kind of what's out of pocket, et cetera. Um, so definitely encourage you to, to take a look at that as well. Um, and then lastly, our fundraising tips and ideas bullet point. Um, as I said, we really are eager to work with students um, to make this program financially accessible. So on top of our financial aid, on top of our low interest loans, um, we want to work with students to, to encourage them to fundraise um, on their own and are really willing to support you all in that process. All right, how to apply. So on our website, we have the apply now link right there, but you can get to it if you go to our Summer Institute homepage, you certainly will be able to find it. No problem from there. Um, I will go over the, the dates, as I mentioned, the December 1st is our priority deadline. Um, I think that we wrote, you'll hear back at latest late January, but I imagine it'll be a little sooner than that, honestly. Um, and then the final deadline is going to be February 1st. Um, so I really encourage you to get your applications in prior to December 1st to get that squared away. Um, but you do have until February 1st. Um, if you are still thinking about your schedule, and what you want to do next summer. Um, in terms of what is involved in the application, we do have students upload transcripts. Um, we have a couple of short essays, which are really you know, short answer questions. They're not too long. Um, and then we have an interview as well for all of our students who apply. That's part of the application process. Um, and applications are open. So they opened on October 1st. Um, and then again, first deadline's December 1st. And then the final deadline is gonna be February 1st. So after your program, I just want to briefly talk about a couple of um, longer term, I guess, benefits to the program. Um, you're going to be able to share about your experience with other students, which is very exciting. Um, I We share this, uh, this slide deck and this presentation with all of our alumni, too, and really encourage them to get their peers involved, their classmates, maybe students who they're in EWH chapters or BMES chapters with. Um, so uh, students are able to give info sessions as well. Um, you also have the opportunity to work as an on the ground coordinator coordinator. Um, so that is something that we um, that we refer to as our trip leader. So on the ground coordinator, that's kind of EWH speak for your trip leader. So each program is going to have two on the ground staff at least. Um, and we really, really like to hire program alumni for these positions. Um, so if you do go on an EWH Institute and you're interested in working with us later on, then you will already have a leg up. In addition, you can add some really practical experience to your resume. So as I mentioned, um, this is you're working in a real hospital with real equipment. Um, so it's a really wonderful way to gain some practical experience outside of the classroom and learn about a new country, a new culture, um, and learn, learn in a brand new way. So I am going to leave this slide up here. You have all of our social media handles, website, um, summerinstitute at ewh.org. That will be your, um, your email address to, to send questions to. Um, anything related to the institutes. And with that, I would love to open the floor to questions. <laughs>